Welcome to Phillips Mill Art Talk. I'm your host, Laura Womack, and with me is our producer, Jen McHugh. Hello. Today we've asked Steve Zazensky to join us as we focus on our annual promotional image. We select an image of Phillips Mill to go on all our promotional materials, posters, postcards, advertising, and lots more for the annual art exhibition. Our artist last year, Jean Childs Buzko, did a wonderful painting filled with color of the classic view of the mill from River Road. She got a lot of media coverage in addition to exposure for her painting, which is automatically in the Phillips Mill Art Show. We'll talk more about the process for entering and selecting that image toward the end of the hour with two members of the art committee. But right now, Steve Zazensky is going to demonstrate painting the mill. That's a surprise treat, a surprise treat that Steve offered us earlier this, year, this week. Steve has been a full-time painter since 1978. He's fully internalized his art and can create a beautiful watercolor or gouache from what is in his mind and in his hands. Steve has been in the Phillips Mill Art Exhibition many times, won awards, and created our promotional image for the 2015 Art Show. We're very pleased to welcome Steve Zazensky to Phillips Mill Art Talk. Thank you. <laughs> All right, Steve, before we begin your demonstration, which um, is, it was a surprise to us and we're really excited to see a watercolor. Uh, is it watercolor or gouache? Yeah, it'll, it'll be watercolor, yep. We're very excited to watch a watercolor of the mill take place before our very eyes in the next uh, hour. But first I'd like to take a look at the image that you did of the Phillips mill for our 2015 promotional image. Okay. Jen, you can draw that up. We'll ask you to talk about how you created it, what, why you chose this perspective. You've got some interesting colors here. What would you like to tell us, Steve, about this? Well, it, it, it's pretty much a straightforward uh, depiction of the mill, not too different from what I'm gonna be doing for you today. Um, I did it as a winter scene, uh, just uh, so it would be a little bit different um, than doing it in the uh, spring or summer. Although I have done some paintings of it uh, um, in the spring or summer. And one of the uh, drawbacks of doing the mill is there aren't a lot of angles that you can get <laughs> to, make, uh, to make an interesting painting because of the odd uh, uh, area where it is right on that uh, turn of the road and uh, uh, it, it's just, there's only a couple different angles that, that really uh, you can do it from in, in order to make it look good. So uh, I chose one, which uh, is pretty straightforward. And I wanted, wanted to uh, include the trees because obviously without the trees, it's uh, not as interesting. So uh, that's what I did. And as far as the uh, colors, you can see the sky is sort of a greenish kind of a sky, which is, uh, that's what I do sometimes. I'll, I'll Oh, kind of uh, change colors a little bit. As long as they get the value correct, usually the colors, uh, you know, you can play around with them a little bit. And uh, I just did it just to be, uh, so it'd be a little bit different. That's all, nothing nothing other than that. I think the, the trees are, sorry, Steve, go ahead. No, go ahead, I, I was finished really, go ahead. Well, I was just gonna say, I think the trees are, are iconic. They're almost like part of the building. And I love that you create, you um, captured that little bit of red that you mm -hmm. can see in the, um, in the trees. Uh, and that gives such a delight when the weather is not great. So, well, this is a beautiful image and we um, we're really glad to um, uh, include it in our promotional materials for 2015. I remember, we're gonna talk a little bit more uh, later in the program about how to submit an image and what that process looks like, uh, how we select the image of the mill and what the criteria are. But Steve, um, you were so kind, not only to join us today, but to um, offer to paint, do a painting for us. And uh, of course, we always love to see artists demonstrate uh, their process. So. Um, what have you got for us today? <laughs> okay, well, what I'm going to do is a similar uh, painting. This will be a vertical rather than a horizontal because I wanted to um, 
emphasize the trees more. And I and I just took a ride there a few days ago just to make sure everything was still where it was supposed to be. <laughs> and uh, uh, there's an awful lot of uh, ivy growing up these trees, which is great because it'll make the trees even more uh, interesting, I think. So what I'm going to do is I'm, I'm, I'm doing this on my iPhone. So what I'm going to do is now take my iPhone and put it on a, uh, a little clip that I have here so that I can get on, uh, get it, get the picture on my drawer. Okay, keep those up there a little bit. Or the painting and what I'm doing. Okay, first I've got to, uh, let's see, first I got to switch from me to the, uh, here we go, to the screen. Okay. There we go. Well, Steve, Steve, while you're getting set up there, I want to invite people to put questions in for Steve into the question and answer because um, we're going to continue talking. Steve, you've been doing this oh, okay. for so long and have really mastered your art. So uh, I think it's impressive that you can, um, you know, talk while you're painting. That would be uh, challenging. Well, yeah. it, it, it makes it easier because uh, if you can, if, uh, you know, like they say, a picture is worth a thousand words. If you can use a few words and actually show someone what you're doing, it uh, makes it a lot, a lot clearer. To a lot, and it's easier for me too, because then I don't have to uh, try to explain it uh, in detail. You could just see what's happening. So. <laughs> right. Sounds good. Okay. And you're okay to take questions oh, as yeah. we go along. Sure. Now, uh, can you see my uh, my uh, painting so far here? Yep. Yep. Okay. It looks great. I love the ivy. That you're right. That uh -huh. looks great. Now, uh, what I did was this is this is watercolor paper, 140 pound arches, uh, and it's on a block, which means it's gummed down on all the all the edges, so that when you wet it, it, it if it wrinkles, it'll dry up nice and tight again. And what I did was I drew with my brush. That's what I've been doing for the last few years. I'll, uh, I'll take a brush, just dip it into some uh, neutral color and I'll do my drawing that way. And uh, this is what the drawing would have looked like. Uh, it's, this is a print I've d I did from a photo. So, but you can see, you can get the idea of, of how it looked before any paint was on it. The only paint would be the, uh, what I did for the drawing. Then the next step I did was uh, I put in the sky and I painted around some of the trees here. Uh, one thing about watercolor, it's transparent. So if you don't, uh, if you, if I painted through the trees, it would already darken them and I might, might want them a little lighter. So I, I kept the, uh, the paint off the uh, trees for now. And, and then the last uh, step I did was putting on these, uh, uh, the ivy. So that's where we are right now. The reason I, I did those few steps is they're kind of boring to watch. They, you know, they're, it's like watching a, uh, um, um, a house being built. The foundation isn't all that interesting. So th this is a little bit more interesting, this part. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna continue uh, on with the trees. And what I'm going to do is, uh, <clears throat> first of all, I, I should tell you that I'm going to do the uh, uh, do the lighting as if it's a sunny day after a snow. So it's always good to know, you know, what you're going after when you, especially with a watercolor, you really got to know. So the sun is going to be coming pretty much like straight on, uh, <clears throat> which is the way it was when I uh, actually let me see, I took a photograph of the mill the other day. And that's the photograph that I used to do the drawing. <clears throat> and that's the way the light was. So I'm going to kind of stick with uh, what I saw that particular day. So the first thing I'm going to do is I'm going to put some tone on the, uh, on the trees themselves. I'm going to mix up some gold ochre, which is a, sort of a dull gold a color and I'm mixing it with romber violet <clears throat> and this what this is going to be is going to be a just a neutral tone I'm going to put a little ultramarine blue in with it too just to gray it a little bit and this is going to be a uh, a neutral tone which is going going to a neutral value I should say which is going to represent the part of the tree that is lit by the sun And that's what I did with the uh, fence here too. I put uh, I put a value on the fence, so this this would be considered the light value of the tree. In other words, as if the sun was hitting this tree in full force, uh, 
With watercolor, you generally work your way from, uh, from the light uh, values down to the dark because of the transparency of, uh, of watercolor. So uh, you don't wanna to go too dark too fast because it's very difficult to then lighten values. We can always make something darker, but it's very difficult to make it uh, lighter in water. You can add water to it and, uh, and kind of blot out a little color if you need to, but if you go too dark, that's kind of impossible. So what I'm gonna do is just, uh, just cover both of these trees. This branch is kind of hanging out here, get a little bit on that, get some here. I have a, a bunch of branches up in this area here. I got my hand in it already. Uh, let's see, I'm gonna start. I'm gonna go a little darker with some of these branches and just get some of these auxiliary branches done here. And, uh, and this will take a couple of minutes. I'll be doing more of these uh, as the painting progresses, but this is just to get, get things started. Looks great, Steve. Already? Gee. <laughs> yeah, I actually am really fond of the ivy. I like what you did with the ivy. Are you done with the ivy? Uh, no, no, no. I still have to put the darker values on the ivy. Uh, the thing with watercolor, when I, when I teach, uh, one of the things uh, that's most difficult for most of my students, uh, if they're not familiar with doing watercolor, is this concept of going from light to dark. It's much more important to understand it in watercolor than it is with opaque media. Uh, <clears throat> uh, once you put that light value on, that light value is gonna represent wherever the sun is hitting the uh, object in the mo uh, with the most intensity. Most intensity. Uh, in order to make this three-dimensional, you have to put a darker value. You have to, you have to really have three, three, a minimum of three values in order to make a third, make it look like the third dimension. You have to have a light value, a dark value, and then an in-between middle value. So the middle value and the dark value go where the shape of the object turns away from the source of light. And like in a tree like this, which is we know a cylindrical shape, if the light is coming this way, well now the sh when the shape of that tree starts turning this way away from the source of light, it's gonna go darker. And then of course the darkest area will be um, where no light gets in at all. And because the sun is coming pretty much straight on here, there's not gonna be a lot of dark on the, uh, on the trunks of the trees because most of the trunk will be uh, in sunlight. But uh, what I'm gonna do now is I'm gonna start putting some of that darker value on the tree trunks. Now I'm mixing, I'm gonna take some ultramarine blue. I'm going to show you my palette too while I'm here. This is a, uh, what they call a John Pike palette. He was a famous watercolorist from the old days. He's been uh, dead for many years, but uh, his palette lives on. And uh, this is uh, what I'm doing. I'm mixing up sort of a gray. I'm taking ultramarine blue and some of that gold ochre and I'm mixing up sort of a gray. Hmm. Your, palette. Your palette looks great. Oh, thank you. <laughs> I, mean, you know, I just yeah. made a, I just slopped a little on the, on the mill there, so I'm just gonna take it off. Okay, so now what I'm gonna do is, that. I'm sorry, what? I was worried about that. <laughs> no, it wasn't too bad. And that's gonna be stone anyway, so no, okay. no worries. Okay, right. so what I'm gonna do now is I, I, I'm going to, that's a little bit too dark. I'm gonna, I'm gonna lighten that up by putting a little bit more water in the mix. Okay, that's still a little too dark. Let me lighten that up a bit. What I'm doing now is I'm determining where I think the shape of the tree is turning away from that source of light. So what, I, what I'm doing is I'm sort of painting in reverse. If I was doing a, um, uh, an, a, a painting in oil or pastel or acrylic or whatever, I could put a middle value on there and then put a light value and a dark value. But here I've got my light value already. So I have to paint around it. It's, it's not as obvious when you're doing a tree, but uh, maybe we'll, there'll be something else here that'll, that I can explain I that a little sense. better. I'm sorry, it what? Makes, it makes sense. You're painting like a cylinder. So you're putting the, the, exactly. the shadows. Yeah. 
Right. So, um, Steve, we have a question from Robin who asks a uh, question I was wondering as well. Are the background trees um, a little bit darker because um, they're over the blue sky or what? why the difference in um, color between those two well, thin trees on the left? Yeah. These here? Well, yeah. uh, <clears throat> one thing I want to do is I want to make these trees more prominent, okay? okay. In order to do that, I want to I want to keep the I want to keep the sunlight brighter on them. These trees here are sort of just going to be uh, kind of in the background. They're going to be there, but I don't want them to be uh, too too prominent. So what I'm going to do is I'm actually going to do the same thing on 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 these trees here, and I'm going to but I'm going to make believe that they're that there's nothing uh, influencing these uh, darks on the trees. So I'm gonna make believe they're standing out there and there's no, no, in, no other influences. And same thing here now, you'll see a little bit later as I start to throw some shadows on those trees, because in an area like this, you're, go you're going to have uh, a load of branches and things that are gonna be casting shadows on top of these, uh, these areas, uh, these other trees here. <laughs> in order to um, in order to make a, an area uh, vibrant, uh, you have to. Well, that's a good good word for it. You have to vibrate the colors a bit. In other words, if you want uh, your viewer to look at a certain area of the painting, you want to have your lightest lights and darkest darks there. Uh, areas that you want to be less prominent, you keep your values closer together, and that's what's going to happen in here because I'm going to put some background trees in there too. <clears throat> so th these these uh, trees will actually uh, be less prominent than they are right now. <clears throat> okay, so I, I did some of the uh, the uh, uh, darker value now on the, on the uh, bark of the tree. Uh, let me go into the uh, the ivy now because the ivy is also going to be one of those areas where the sun is going to be hitting sort of straight on. But again, as the, the ivy is sort of following the curve of the tree. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna darken some of the, I'm using some dark green here. It's called perline green. It's a, sort of a dead dark green. And another thing that's gonna happen is with the ivy, uh, with the leaves growing uh, outward this way, what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna put some, some little dark touches in here to show the dark areas underneath where those leaves come out. So in other words, the lighter value of green are gonna represent where the leaves are kind of popping out and catching the sun. And the darker uh, areas of green are gonna represent the areas that uh, the sun is not getting into quite as much. And uh, hopefully I can get that to look the way I want it. I'm going to do a little bit and then I'm going to add more and more as the uh, painting progresses. So Steve, your hand is working so fast. Is that because you're trying to do this in an hour or is that just how fast you work? Uh, uh, both. Uh, I do work fast. Um, when, you, when you've been doing it as long as I have, you don't have to th you stop and think as much. Um, you, you kind of do all your thinking before you start painting about what, you, uh, you're, what you're gonna do and how it's gonna be done. And you know, I've got a couple of days now since I had this done to think about exactly what I'm gonna be doing. So it's just a matter of you know, getting it done. Uh, so <clears throat> now hopefully, uh, hopefully these uh, green leaves, even though there's not a lot of difference between the light and dark, uh, they, I, I hope <clears throat> they're starting to look a little bit more three-dimensional. Absolutely. Okay. Now this, uh, this other uh, area of green leaves here, the ivy leaves, uh, th these are going to be catching a little less light. So I'm going to make, make these a little bit darker, just leave a little bit of light. I'm just going to remind our attendees that if you have questions for Steve, um, please write them in the uh, question and answer and uh, we'll get them answered for you. Okay, now what I'm going to do is uh, do a little bit more detail on the trees. I'm going to put a little little dark note here, get a little bit darker here. 
underneath the, the ivy here will also be casting a bit of a shadow down on the on the uh, trunk of the tree because the sun is up fairly high. Uh, even though it's winter and the sun is low, it's still going to be up higher than the uh, the landscape itself. So it's going to be casting a little bit of shadow down. And I want to get my my uh, darkest value now in here. I have a middle value. That was the first darker value I put in. And now I'm getting my uh, darkest value in. Now the uh, these trees in particular, uh, they tend to, to uh, uh, the bark tends to get white up at the top. That's why I left some of that white up there. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna just simply darken the, uh, the uh, side of the uh, these white branches that are popping out white like this. I'm just darkening the uh, shadow side of these branches. And I'm gonna add more branches again as the painting progresses. Okay, then I'm gonna get uh, down now to the uh, mill itself. Now for the mill, it's mostly stone. <clears throat> we have this little addition here, which is where everybody walks in with their paintings. And if I remember correctly, that was a uh, sort of a a, a, a cream colored uh, siding with a uh, stone uh, a foundation. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna put some uh, color down on the mill itself using some gold ochre and a little touch of uh, romba violet. And what I'm gonna do is uh, that's, yeah, that's not too bad. I'm gonna keep it a little bit lighter. And again, the same process, what I'm gonna do is put a, uh, a, <clears throat> a light value down on the stone because the sun is gonna be hitting most of it. And then once we put the, uh, some shadows on from the tree, you'll see how that, uh, how that really perks up. Now here, <clears throat> here we have a door I can paint right over that. That door is going to be a dark green. If you remember, that's that uh, second door there. Yep. And uh, that's a that's a dark green. So uh, any dark color, uh, if you're if you have a light color under it with watercolor, you can paint a dark color over a light color. Right. So there's, there's really no reason why you have to have to keep it uh, keep the paper white. Okay. Now. <clears throat> And there's also a little bit of the side of the building showing here. And I'm just going to put some tone. These are those big windows that are up on the second store here. Story, I should say. This is the uh, stone uh, foundation here. And I'm going to put just a little bit of uh, <coughs> color. Oops, I got some of the green come down on that. I'm going to take a paper towel and <laughs> just dab it off. See, it's not too bad. Excellent. As long as, as long as you get it when it's wet. And this is right. going to be most mostly in shadow anyway. So I'm putting a little tone on this uh, little part of the building here now too. And this there's a little piece of that green door is going to be sticking out there too. Okay. And then <clears throat> we also have uh, a couple of, uh, I don't know what they are. There's some sort of things growing up there that have a lot of, uh, th th sort of like a wisteria bush and stuff like that. Yeah, exactly. A little arbor. Yeah, uh, Steve, more. I have a question from Sue Ann who wants to know, do you paint um, plein air as well? Uh, I do occasionally. I don't uh, do it very often, though, because I like to compose things in the studio uh, where I can uh, have more, a lot more control over things. Uh, when you're outside, uh, mm, you know, some people do very well with plein air, but the light is changing constantly. Um, uh, and then you tend to see everything, you know, and it's <laughs> it's more difficult to kind of edit what you want to leave in, what you want to take out. I just find that for me, it's just more comfortable working in the studio. And uh, and I, I respect the plein air painters that do a good job on it because uh, I uh, I don't uh, I don't particularly care to do it as much. Uh, but uh, I guess that's the only answer I could I could come up with. Yeah. Everyone has their, their own uh, style. Oh sure, yeah, yeah. I used to uh, I, I used to go up uh, up to Rockport, Massachusetts, uh, for many years uh, when I first started uh, painting, 
And there was a, a painter up there, Betty Lou Schlem was her name, a very good watercolorist. Uh, she, uh, she's dead now, but uh, she was uh, a wonderful artist. And I used, to, uh, I used to go out painting with her once in a while. And she always did everything plein air. And that was her, her joy and her, uh, her uh, way of doing things. And if there was a, a day where it was raining and bad weather or whatever, what she'd do is she'd set up a, uh, a still life in her studio and do a still life. But uh, I, uh, I'm, uh, I'm a different person. And I have a different, uh, uh, different way of thinking and doing it. So this, this is what I do. Okay, so what I've done now is I put uh, some brown on there to show... Uh, <clears throat> some of that growth on the arbor there and i've uh i've done a little bit of uh the uh the tone on there of course the the snow is going to be on the roof another thing i should say with watercolor uh we use the white paper as a value and when we're doing a sn <clears throat> snow scene the white paper is going to stand for the uh, sunlit snow in other words wherever the sun is hitting the snow that's going to be white paper there's no value uh, that I have on my palette. There's no paint that you could buy that's a higher value than the white paper. So we use it in a snow scene as the sunlit part of the snow. And uh, if we're doing something that's not a snow scene, say uh, a white uh, cottage or a house or something uh, standing in the landscape, we'll use the white paper as the sunlit side of the house. So, uh, or if it's a picket fence or anything like that, anything that's a painted white object. Uh, as far as clouds, we, uh, I don't use the white paper for clouds because clouds are never as bright as, any, as, as, as something that's painted white in the landscape. So I always put a little tone on before I do anything with clouds in it. Okay, now <clears throat> I have a little bit more work to do on the, uh, on the, uh, the fence here. <clears throat> what I'm going to do is I'm just going to put a, put some dark areas. Again, the sun is kind of coming straight on. So I'm going to put a little darker note here on each of these uh, little fence posts, just to show where the, where the uh, fence post is not getting any sun. So this will just take a minute. It's basically <laughs> just, go ahead. Are you working? Uh, Paula wants to know. Um, well, first of all, she says beautiful work. Thank you. Uh, and uh, I agree with her. Um, she'd like to know if you're using wet or dry paper. Uh, the paper is dry. Uh, the only time uh, I use uh, wet on wet is like when I do the sky. And even then, I don't really wet the paper first, but I'll go in with a, uh, I'll show you the brush I use for skies. Uh, this is a, an oval wash brush. This, this picks up a lot of water and a lot of paint. And uh, what I do is I get it full of paint and water and I'll put it down on the sky so that it's very, very wet. So that when I put a darker value in that uh, they will mix together. So when you want things to blend together that way, you, you, you'll wet the paper first. But it, the more control you, you want or need in a painting, the, the less water you're gonna use. Uh, uh, when you're painting on dry paper, you have a lot more control over where things are. Uh, when, <clears throat> if, if I started putting the um, ivy on the trees before the sky was dry, that green would bleed into the sky in a lot of spots. In some areas, it would be fine. Uh, I could just sort of darken it later on, but in some areas, it would just go too far. So you really have to be careful with watercolor as to how much uh, water you use and where you use it. Okay, now what I wanna do, uh, let's see, let me just finish up this, this fence here. Now what I wanna do is I wanna start throwing some shadows on the, uh, on the building itself. <clears throat> and what I'm gonna do is again, I'm gonna mix up some, some blue. I use two blues, I use ultramarine blue and I use cerulean blue. I'm gonna mix those two together. And they're a little too garish uh, as they come out of the tube that way. So I'm gonna take a little of that raw umber violet and mix it in. And you see how it grays the blue? Right. I'm gonna use that as my shadow value. Now I'm going to take a look at my original photograph that I used. And I see I have a shadow coming from this tree here 
which is hitting the, uh, the roof. And it's coming down like this. And there's some branches coming off. And we also have that coming down this way a bit. And let's see, let's get a few more of these. these I'm gonna put a couple extra branches on there. Because <laughs> I like, like the way it looks. Yeah. It, that's one thing a photographer uh, has uh, going against them. They can't, they can't add things like this. <laughs> I can put a, I can put a few extra branches on, on things and whatever. Okay, and if we take a look, it's kind of hard to see. Uh, uh, it's hard for, even for me to see, but here's the tree, the sunlit part of the tree. And then we have that little uh, part of the building, that, uh, the entranceway, and it's mostly in shadow. And that's from this tree here. If we think of the shadow going back this way, it's going to basically cover most of that that little part of the building. It's going to go, going to hit the uh, the roof, and then it's going to run up onto the windows back there. It's amazing how much depth you, that already has given it. The painting. The depth, yeah, okay, yeah, yeah, that's 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 what does it. Now, of course, there's there should be a little overhang too, of the roof, so that'll cast a bit of a shadow onto the onto the uh, face of the uh, of the building, and then of course <clears throat> there's enough going on here with these um, uh, these dead branches that they will cast some shadow down on the building also. And of course, then we have the, uh, I didn't do the arbor, so I'm gonna just put these these lines in to uh, represent the, uh, the arbor itself. And uh, then I'm gonna take a little smaller brush and I'm gonna take some of this brown. And what I'm gonna do is, I'm gonna do the same thing I did is with the ivy. What I'm gonna do is I'm gonna put some darker notes in, in here in order to especially on the bottom uh, to show where the, where the sunlight is not hitting it as strong. So first it was a silhouette. Now by putting these little darker <coughs> dots in there, <clears throat> and then I'm gonna take my finger and just kind of smudge them a little bit like that. And that, <clears throat> that'll give you a little bit of vibration there between sunlight and shadow. Okay, now <clears throat> I wanna get the door done, which is gonna be a dark green. So I'm going to take my perlene green, and, and <clears throat> I have two greens. This is a dark perlene green, and this is this is called uh, cadmium green pale, which is a very very bright uh, sort of uh, grassy green, which I use as my light green. And this is going to be. Let's see, the door is going to be. <laughs> I kind of lost where my door is. I got to take a look. <laughs> Uh, oh, it's actually right next to the little, uh, the little uh, billboard here. Okay. So, um, Steve, I, I'm yeah. sorry, I've been neglecting the questions as I've been fascinated to watch you. Um, are you using the dry brush technique? Uh, from... No, no. Dry, dry brush is when you actually have a fairly dry brush, and you use it to uh, to. I will do that later in the trees. I'll show you how that how that works. You take some paint off the palette, generally a darker color and not much water at all. In fact, hardly any water. The brush is damp, but not really wet. And what you do is you scrape it on the paper. And what happens is th this paper has a little tooth to it. It's, it's a cold pressed paper, which means it, it's not completely smooth. It has a little bit of roughness to it. And the dark particles will stick to the high spots. And it's good for texture. Uh, I'll show you how that works a little later on. Okay. Uh, more toward the end of the painting. Okay, now what I'm gonna do, let's see, I'm gonna put a little shadow here. This is that little uh, um, bulletin board that you have there on a, on a, on a stick or on a, uh, a pole, I should say. Oh. And here's the, uh, here's the, um, the handrails. We'll put those in. I don't think I even put those in in the uh, the uh, one that was used on the poster. Okay, now I'm going to do a little darker area here on the door because of the shadow 
of the uh, of the uh, overhanging bush. And uh, I put in the green door here. This is the, the, the entrance door here. And uh, a little bit of that shadow was going to hit that door. So I made that a little bit darker. OK, right. and then we have what? Go ahead. Uh, we've oh. got a bunch of question. I'm a little worried about the time here. We've got a lot of interest in what you're doing. So um, quickly, what are the brands? What's the brand you're using? Brand of paint? Also, uh, yeah. Uh, uh, mostly Windsor Newton, and I also use Holbein. Uh, Holbein, I use the, it's the uh, cadmium green pale is Holbein. Uh, Perlene green is uh, Windsor Newton. Well, mostly Windsor Newton is what I use. Now this little gray thing here I put in is, is a little bit of the, the footpath that's been uh, clear, cleared up. Okay, <clears throat> now uh, I, <clears throat> I wanna get some, uh, <clears throat> some background trees in now here. Uh, <clears throat> I wanna get that a little darker. So I'm gonna take my, uh, ultra, my ultramarine and mix it with some of the uh, raw and violet. Uh, a little bit more of the brown, let's see. And I'm going to go in between these trees here. Now this is going to be the distant trees at the other side of the uh, the little stream there. And if we're running out of time, uh, like uh, we spoke of earlier, I can continue doing this, and uh, you can take care of some other business, and then you could just come back to me, and I'll just keep working on this, and you can see. Uh, what happens, uh, you know, once it's finished. Sounds good. The, we're also going to, um, we're gonna to try to keep your, your um, visual up, Steve, while you go, because I know people oh, okay. see that. If we might have to break away a little bit because we wanna show some of the past posters. Yeah, but, sure, um, sure. Um, we do have, I do have a question about your violets and magentas. Okay. Um, I'm not, uh, let me the, see. The raw that. umber violet? Yeah, that, that's a color that I started using a couple of years ago. It's only made by a couple of different companies. Uh, Cheap Joe's is a, uh, a art supply place in North Carolina. He has a line of paints called American Journey. And one of his colors is raw umber violet. It's, I'll show it to you here. It's, it's, a, so it's a brownish sort of, uh, sort of like a winish color. And if you mix it with the, uh, with the uh, ultramarine blue, it gives you a nice sort of purpley gray. And that's the only reason I use it. It gives you a, a little bit different gray rather than just a, uh, a battleship gray. All right, good. So uh, Steve, uh, Jim is very appreciative of how open you are with your, uh, with your palette. So we appreciate that. Thank you oh, for sharing. My pleasure. All right, let's see. Um, Jen, if we can keep the painting up while we talk a little bit about the um, image selection process, uh, let's bring in uh, our art committee, Phillips Mill Art Committee members, uh, Mary Flamer, who is head of the online, uh, the, sorry, the on-site show. Mary is in charge of the show that will be in the mill. They'll be the same paintings, but she's running the mill part of the show. And Joanne Goodwin has been uh, a member of the art committee for I can't I can't tell you how long, um, and neither can she. But it's been a long time, and she knows a lot of our history. So, Joanne, if you wouldn't mind um, joining us with your video and your audio, and we've got Mary here. Uh, and okay. So thank you guys so much for joining us. Thanks for all the hard work that you do on the art show every year. Uh, you guys know how much I appreciate that and we all do. Mary, um, can you tell us a little bit about how artists uh, enter to um, the competition to for the image, the promotional image? Certainly. I'm uh, feeling a little guilty interrupting this fabulous art uh, exhibition, but I'll be brief. Um, the information I'm going to share with you will be repeated in detail on the Phillips Mill website. At the end of this, I will uh, reference the site. The Phillips Mill Art Committee is, being, is beginning preparations for 2021. 
the 92nd juried art show with the selection of the image that will advertise the show. We ask artists to portray the mill as the iconic home of Bucks County's most prestigious juried art show. This is artwork that is a rendition of Phillips Mill as we're seeing before our eyes now um, in your unique artistic style. The submission period is March 1st to the end of March 29th. The artwork will be included in advertising, in advertising, promotion, and public relations, including our posters, invitations, advertising, social media, and the website. Best of all, the winning artwork will be displayed in the fall exhibition. In past years, it has often been sold. The selected artists will receive a $400 uh, honorarium and a portion of the sales price. To be considered, the artwork must meet the following criteria. All of this information is will be posted on the website. But for um, now, the art must reside within, artists rather, must reside within 25 miles of Phillips Mill. All images must be of the Phillips Mill. All two-dimensional media is acceptable. Video, photography, machine-made prints and reproductions will not be accepted. Submitted artworks can be no larger than 20 by 24 inches. Artwork must be framed unless it has framed edges. Finally, artwork will undergo a jurying process for selection. Now, Joanne will give you further details and uh, and then um, I will conclude with um, a little bit more information for submitting. Joanne? Hi, um, I wanted to show you um, all of the images that we've had since we started the selection process. This um, image was done by an artist named William Francis Taylor. And I believe he, you, he did this in the 1960s and it had, was used up until 2011 as the main image of the show. Every year, all the stationery, all the posters, everything had this image um, on them. And then the printing and so forth went on top. And then in about 2011, um, we just, oh, and this is also, this is a modern version of that uh, updated by Kathy Junkowskis, who is an artist and um, a member of the art committee. So that's a little bit more simplified version of that. But again, it's very simple. So in 2011, we thought that it might be more interesting if we started um, looking at actual paintings, since that's the main thing that we see in the art show. And so they asked members of the committee and other people if we had images. It was too, too late for us to you know, ask the public or an artist to submit. So we looked at uh, various pieces that uh, people on the committee had, and this particular one was chosen, and it's by Ray Overpeck. Um, and then in 2012, this one was done, um, I believe this is the first year that we actually had artists submitting their work and the um, image selection committee chose from several, p or maybe 15 pieces altogether. This was the final one. Um, and this one is by George Thompson. It's fun to see this because it's a back view of the uh, mill, which you don't see all the time. It's and a then, sorry. Laura? Sorry to interrupt you, Joanne. I, just, I love them all, <laughs> but it yeah. is nice to see a different angle. Yeah. Yeah, it's interesting. Okay, this one um, in 2013, so that was 2012. This is the second year that we actually had people submitting their work for choice. And this one is by Lu Luis Viela from 2013, a fairly traditional um, rendering of it. Now, in 2014, we're getting into some really interesting color. This is by John Mertz. Um, and he, he did this um, really stunning looking image and we, it was great on posters. That's one of the things that we want the piece to be. We want it to be graphically very striking so that it, you know, the posters that we have it on stand out. 
Okay, and the next one is by Steve Zazinski, who's here with us painting today. This is his submission from um, 2015. It's interesting to see the difference in colors that he's using now and then. Um, this one is called Autumn Glory, and it's also by John Merckx. So John Merckx is the only artist that I know of that we've had or we've chosen twice. And again, he's using very vivid colors. This one he calls Autumn Glory. This was 2016. Okay, um, in 2017, this is really exciting, I think, by Tom Gass, um, and it's just great. We have the Phillips Mill Inn, and then we have the Phillips Mill, and then that great looking sky. So that was very, very different than anything we had seen before. This is another one that's very different. This is a collage done by Catherine, Catherine, Kathleen, sorry, Ammon, and she used Japanese printed papers to make her collage. I think it's, it's very exciting. And this, this one is from 2019, Opening Night by John Gersa, or Joe Gersak. A beautiful image and not one that we see because she, um, Joe has really focused on the lower level of people going in, actually the middle level, that lower door into the downstairs of the mill and then all the tables on the outside and the big tent on Opening Night. And then um, in 2020, uh, Jean Childs Busco did this uh, really interesting painting of really different colors. Um, I think it's, it's very effective. So as you can see, there are a lot of ways that artists have portrayed the mill and we really look forward to seeing what gets submitted this year. That's great. So um, before we get to the details of submission, Mary, would the two of you talk about what um, you know, aesthetically, the art committee is looking for in terms of an image for this year? Well, Joanne, would you like to start? Sure. I'm, I think primarily we'd like something that reads well from a distance, kind of, you know, it doesn't have to be a completely detailed depiction of the mill building. It would be nice if you can identify it. But I mean, basically, we want to have an image of the mill in the area that is visible from a distance, identifiable possibly from a small distance. Mary? Uh, I think that's a good point. Um, this will be on banners. It will be on um, postcards, invitations. It will be on all the media that we need to, um, uh, to uh, advertise this show. So it should be striking and, um, but also uh, it should be as, as, as creative as your imagination allows. Anything, collage, yeah. you saw that example. Yes. Yeah, so I think, you know, just before, last question before we get to the, um, the details of submission, I think a lot of people assume that we want that one angle, which we're always happy to see. And Steve is showing us a great image of that angle. Um, and they also think that we want the impressionist uh, because that's what Bucks County is known for. And that's, you know, our roots. Is that true? Do we want that angle, the impressionism? No, and you don't have to have this angle of the building either. Um, you could take take an angle of it, stay, if you might get killed standing in the street right there at the corner. <laughs> <laughs> don't you know, <laughs> I was gonna say the same thing, that um, angle up from the opposite side yeah. is interesting. Um, right. And in fact, it has some interesting architecture from the period in which the mill was purchased. But yeah. um, I would suggest that perhaps four o'clock in the morning if you want to do that side. <laughs> there was a big broken off chunk of the building when trucks hit it, which happens practically a couple times a year on that far corner. What about season? Do we care about season? No, nope. no. Just as long as it's a striking, interesting image. Yes. Thank you both. All right, Mary, how do we submit if we want to um, enter that competition? Well, um, submission of artwork, once again, must be from uh, between March 1st and March 29th. Uh, you uh, have seen the um, listing where we would like the, the website, rather, that we'd like for you to submit. And that's art show, one word, at Phillips Mill, one word dot org. Um, also, uh, we ask that the artists uh, email a high resolution JPEG of their work 
showing the frame. If you find, um, you will find additional information at this website where you can also forward your questions. We look forward to your entries and thank you for considering a submission of your artwork to Phillips Mill. That's great. And yep. uh, we're gonna go back to Steve in a minute, just two points. Jen has very helpfully put that, um, the email address to submit and the website where you can get more information or you can get these details. Um, uh, so you can look in the chat for that, but also um, uh, how it, does the art committee select the image? I think people would like to know how it's chosen. Normally well, we have a jury for the art show itself. As yes, it is. A oh, go, go ahead, ahead Joy. I was going to say, as <laughs> they're submitted, um, the committee, there's a, a, a selection committee that's smaller than the entire uh, art show committee. May, uh, I don't know. In the past, recently, it's been three people. Um, before that, it was more people. But they review as they come in, um, that committee reviews the images and says, you know, they pick, they rate them. And then um, they, the ones that have the highest rating go on to the next level. Eventually, I believe around five are brought into the mill one day and the entire art committee sees them. They're set up on the stage and everybody votes. We have paper ballots and we vote and that's how we choose. And the art committee can be as many as 25 people there one day, that day. So we don't, so um, we don't have anything to do, members of the art committee have nothing to do with the jury selection, but in this case, it is the collective, no one person on the art committee chooses. It's the right. consensus That's of the right. committee. It's done by secret ballot. Right. Yes, it is, exactly. That's right. Okay, Mary Flamer, head of our on-site show and Joanne Goodwin, who does the flowers and has been in the show several times herself. Um, thank you both so much for sharing that information with us today. Thank you, Thank Laura. you. All right, let's, Jen, let's see what Steve has been up to. Hey. Okay, I'm going to take the tape off because it's always going to look better with the, uh, all the sloppiness gone. <laughs> I'm getting to the, getting to the end here. Uh, it looks great, Steve. Thank you. I haven't put any detail on the stonework yet on, on the uh, mill, so I'd like to get to that so I can show you a little bit of that. <clears throat> Just as you started talking, I, <laughs> I started doing some dry brushing. Do you see how uh, I just used the brush and I kind of scraped on the, on the paper just to get that sort of effect? Steve, then, you're, um, you're uh, sorry to interrupt you. You're, uh, the, your camera is focused the, the painting is a little oh. bit of you. There you go. Yeah. Great. Okay. Okay. Uh, yeah. Right over here, this area here. Notice how when I, I use the side of my brush and I scraped up, and that's that's dry brush right there. Okay. And actually, what I did here too is a, is a little bit of a dry brush, but it was a little bit more water involved with that. So now what I'm doing is I'm, I'm putting some darker notes um, to show the uh, the roughness of the stone here put a few uh, verticals and a few uh, horizontals. Okay. And take my finger, just smudge them a little bit. Steve, how many times have you painted the mill? Is this your second time? Uh, no, <laughs> no, I've I've done other ones too. In fact, uh, before uh, before the um, you had the uh, the contest or the competition in order to do the uh, mill for a poster, um, I had a, a, a po uh, let me show it to you. Uh, so you had used you had used it once before. I'll show it to you. There we go. And this was, uh, let's see what year was this? 2006. Oh, that's lovely. Yeah. That's uh, where I did the mill uh, with the restaurant, with the flags and all that. Yeah. 
Uh, it's paint. It's painted with a little bit more. Um, it's not as loose as I paint now. It's a little, a little tighter. But uh, it was used Sorry. on it. We talked about that, and I hadn't seen it before. So thanks for showing that. Oh, you're welcome. Yeah, the uh, the fun part about that is uh, that year that that my painting was on the poster, I got rejected from the show. So. <laughs> <laughs> So, you know what, it happens to the best, you know, know. having to use know. the best. I, 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 amazing paintings come through our hands and I know we just have a small building. So, um, I know no, you don't have to apologize. It's okay. I, 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 I finished, I finished crying a long time ago. <laughs> <laughs> and what I did was I put a little dark value on there now to show the uh, roof itself uh, where the snow is not uh, sticking to the roof. So I'm just uh, I'm just taking a little bit of that value off of there, and then uh, I need to uh, I need to paint these little little uh, dormers here. Uh, I don't want these things to stick out too much, so they're just kind of in the background. Uh, now another thing that happens with watercolor is watercolor generally will dry up lighter than what you put it put it down in initially, and here uh, my. Um, my uh, shadow got a little bit uh, lighter than uh, what I would want. The shadow on the snow, that's a good value for that. But this being a darker color in sunlight, this, this is like a sort of a tannish uh, cream. The shadow would actually go a little darker on that because the, uh, the, the color of, the, of the, the underlying surface is a little darker. So the, uh, the shadow needs to go a little darker. And, uh, I also, I did a few, uh, as you can see on uh, this tree, uh, I took some uh, shadows and showed some shadows of branches, which uh, I should do on this one too. Uh, all these branches here will be casting shadows down on onto the sunlit parts of the tree. And I added some more branches up there and uh, maybe just one more little thing and then uh, we can call it call it a day. I'm just going to put uh, some distant trees in here just to uh, get that area here looking a little a little nicer. Now, I, I'm going to do a little dry brush here and I, I see I knocked a lot of the water out of my brush. See how dry the brush is? So now I'm just going to take it and use that to, uh, to make these little uh, sort of uh, flicks of the brush. And uh, I guess that's about it. Maybe I'm going to add a, a little bit more shadow right here. Okay, yeah. get that a little bit darker, get this a little bit darker. And uh, I guess that, uh, that's about it. I added some shadow down here as if there's another uh, tree or something here. And that's casting some shadow down on the snow. Same thing here. This would be like another tree, uh, some branches coming off it. I darken this up. This will be uh, the asphalt road uh, where the plow came through. And that's, uh, that's pretty much it, I guess. I could keep fiddling around with uh, some more of the values and all, but I know we don't have the time for that. So I'll just call it a day. Uh, I'm going to show off my fluorescent light. And I think that'll give you a little bit nicer uh, color that way. It looks great, Steve. We've got all sorts of comments in the um, chat talking about uh, what a treat this is, which I have to agree. I wish we um, had known earlier, I would have <laughs> shouted it from the rooftops that you were gonna do this. Oh, thank you. Um, and what a beautiful painting it is. I just, just think it's extraordinary that you did this in an hour. I have one last question for you, Steve. What did you use to do the uh, drawing that you started with? I just uh, I just drew it with a brush. I just took a brush like this, dipped it in some paint, and, and drew it. That's all. It's so precise. It looks like you like a draft. You know, a, you know, a draftsman's uh, image. So. Well, the the brushes that I use, uh, they point up very well. See the little point on that? Uh, yeah. Put it there yep. so you can see. And uh, these brushes, uh, once you press down on them, they'll come back to shape. Very right nice. back to shape. So uh, these are not expensive either. They're made by Princeton. They're uh, they're half natural bristle and half nylon, and uh, they work very well. Very good. 
Um, I think also I just wanted to share with you the comment from Sue Ann that um, I think she's referring to 2006 that you had the most art in the exhibit, the Phillips Mill exhibit that year. So there you go. <laughs> Is that right? <laughs> I'm going to take her word for it. I think she okay. she's talking about. But um, thank you so much, Steve. This has really been a treat. You're quite welcome. Um, and so that's uh, Steve Zazensky who joined us for this demonstration of painting the mill. We hope that you'll enter uh, your images of the mill. Uh, that we're accepting those in March 1 to 29. And the information about that is at phillipsmill.org. Uh, Steve Zazensky has done it twice. Um, uh, so thank you, Steve. And thank you to Mary Flamer and Joanne Goodwin from the Art Committee for telling us about that process. Um, I can't wait to see what images we get. That's always part of the fun of being on the Art Committee. Thank you also to Jen McHugh, our producer. You're there welcome. she's waving. <laughs> I'm here. <laughs> I'm sorry, Jen, I was reading all the questions today. We didn't hear that much from you today. I apologize. That's um, and also to thanks to Dennis Riley, who works behind the scenes. Both of them make this show possible. So I'm personally very yeah. grateful to them as well. Thank you all in the audience who joined us today. We love having you here with us. We appreciate your questions and we appreciate you spending a Sunday afternoon with us. We hope you'll come again in two weeks uh, when John Schmidtberger of Frenchtown is our guest, he's won the Patrons Award for painting two years in a row, which is an impressive accomplishment. And he'll talk with us about his work and also about his gallery, where he's on both sides of the gallerist and painter relationship. Thank you again. Happy Super Bowl. This is Phillips Mill Art Talk on Laura Womack. Bye.